of time for her. I feel like Elaine, you're always in hiring mode. She's always like, no, it's going to be fine, but we will be having someone coming on soon with a new email address. Okay, so we're at four o'clock. So Amy, are we ready to open up the room? Good luck and thanks to everybody again. Welcome everybody. I see we're starting to have some participants join us for our eighth and final installment of the ADE Teacher Roundtable. Not final forever, final for this US school year, this grant cycle year. So we'll be picking them back up again in September. Looks like we've got a good crowd joining us today. So we're just giving people a few moments to enter the room. And as always, I see we always have a strong contingent from Italy joining us. So the Italy team, you can always count on to show up in numbers. Hi, Jan, coming from Washington State. So wonderful to see everybody joining us. As you're joining us, it would be great if you wanna just say hello in the chat. Uh, you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat box. You can click on there and say hello, introduce yourself if you're a teacher say where you teach and who you teach. If you're from a program site, let us know which program site you're from. And I'm not gonna to allow too much time for people to join us because I know we've got a really packed round table today and we'll be lucky if we actually get through the entire hour with even half of the great stuff that our panelists have to share with us today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started and first, I just wanna thank you all for coming to our eighth installment of the Amgen Biotech Experience Teacher Roundtable Series. I'm Jessica Juliuson, the Director of Community and Strategy for the ADE Program Office. And I'm so happy you all could join us for this final roundtable in this year's series. We know this can be a tough time of year for educators, very, very busy, so we're glad you could take the time. And as many of you know, these sessions were originally designed specifically for our ADE Master Teacher Fellows. And this year we wanted to open the series up to our incredible ADE teacher community from around the world as a chance for them to learn from experts and from each other about topics that are of special interest to science and biotech teachers. And so we hope you find this series valuable. Please feel free to tag us in social media if you wanna share your thoughts using the tag at ABE Prague office on Twitter. So Amy's usually pretty good about dropping that in the chat. If you can, you can put that in there for anyone who wants to tweet. This roundtable will be recorded and posted on our website and registered participants, which is all of you, will also receive a transcript of the discussion and a copy of the materials shared today. We do have some time for audience questions at the end of the presentation. So please, we encourage you at any time to put your questions in the chat box at any time during the discussion. And we will be watching that and we'll be sure to ask your questions at the end. So I'm glad to share that today we have an absolutely stellar panel representing the ABE United Kingdom, ABE Ireland, and ABE Massachusetts program sites. And today they'll be discussing the importance of bioethics as an emerging field, strategies for integrating bioethics into science classrooms, and they'll be sharing examples of classroom activities and curricula that they have used to help students explore this new domain in biotechnology. So I don't wanna take up too much more time, so let me introduce our distinguished roundtable panelists. Tammy Fay is a teacher from ABE Massachusetts. Tammy has a bachelor's degree in biotechnology, has two master's degrees in education, and is currently completing her doctorate in STEM leadership. This June, which is this month, she's completing her 25th year in education with 18 as a high school biological sciences educator and six as the STEM department head. She's also a very familiar presence as a master teacher at professional development events, and she's been just a tremendous asset to the development of our ABE program and community. So thanks for being with us today, Tammy. Elaine Quinn is the site director for ABE Ireland. Elaine has a master's in science communication from Dublin City University and Queen's University Belfast and is a member of the Public Relations Institute of Ireland. She's the Institute Manager in UCD Conway Institute and has more than 18 years experience in communications, public engagement, and graduate education. She also manages the Patient Voice in Cancer Research, an initiative to build connections between cancer patients and researchers. She's also a fantastic host and helped us organize the ABE program meeting back in 2018 when we could all actually see each other in person. So thank you for sharing your time with us today, Elaine. And our third panelist is Karen Stevens, a teacher at our ABE United Kingdom program site. 
After finishing a PhD in molecular genetics at the University of Leeds, Karen enjoyed postgraduate work and opportunities to engage in science communication with a range of audiences, which led her to do a PGCE in biology at the University of Cambridge. Since completing this in 2005, Karen has worked as an educator with the 11 to 18 year old age range, which is always fun, been involved in teacher professional development and was an integral part of the ABE UK program from 2011 to 2019. We're so happy to have her back with us. We can't wait to learn more about what she's been doing with her students. So welcome, Karen. And so I'm gonna get right into it with some questions about bioethics and why this topic matters right now. And Tammy, I'm gonna start with you. So please tell us just a little more about your role and the students that you teach. And how do you define bioethics and why do you think it's an important topic to introduce to your students? Thank you, Jess. Um, I'm the Science Technology Engineering Department Chair and I teach in an upper middle class high school north of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we're a seven through 12 district, so I have the opportunity to work with educators at all levels, which I really enjoy, especially around um, integrating curricula such as bioethics. So when I was teaching full time, bioethics was a course I developed. And one of the reasons I felt passionately about it was it was a way to explore values um, while combining philosophy into a into a world that's changing faster than it ever has been. So how do our young people make decisions that aren't just based on opinions, but based on the examination of the science, relevant science and the values that we hold as a society and as a community? So those, were, those would be sort of how I would encompass um, the importance of or bioethics and why I teach it that way. Um, your last part, I, th I think I did that mostly. I think I got it. You definitely did. And whatever you didn't want to say, we can get you later with other questions. Lots of great questions. Okay. Thank um, you. So thank you, Tammy. And Elaine, how about you? Um, can you share a little more about the students that you encounter at your program site and why you think bioethics is important to introduce to them? Sure. Um, so I said I'm an institute manager in a biomedical research institute. So we have about 400 researchers who are working in areas like cancer, diabetes, obesity, uh, motor neuron disease. So, you know, for, for them, their every day is, is focused around research ethics, particularly if they are working with human or animal tissues. They have to go through that process of uh, getting approval for their research projects. So really, it's, it starts there. And then we've been uh, in my role as an ABA site director for, for ABA. Ireland, we've been looking at how we can incorporate those, those questions around uh, bioethics into the work that we're, we're doing. So primarily, you know, we're training teachers to teach these molecular biology techniques within the classroom. But I think, you know, in addition to the hands-on, the practical aspect, it's really important that they have that discussion while they're, they're, they're doing that practical piece with their, their students. So I suppose, you know, for me, Bioethics, it's really about, you know, setting your moral compass when it comes to, uh, the, you know, the context of these advances in, in biotechnology and, uh, and biology and whether it's systems or processes and um, setting as a society, what are the acceptable norms then that we're going to agree on when we're actually dealing with, uh, with these biological topics. Um, so, you know, I, I think as a society, as a citizen and as researchers, we, we all need to have this as um, you know as, as Tammy said not just opinions but an evidence-based um, uh, way of discussing these really really key topics that are going to have an impact on society for, for a long time to come. And I'm hearing from both of you that this idea of science is something that's just objective and kind of factual and, and very cut and dried on paper it sounds like introducing elements that, are, that don't fall into that definition is something that's important to you. Karen, is that true for you? Can you tell us a little bit about where you teach and what your students are like and why you think bioethics is important to introduce to them? Uh, so I'm gonna bring the teacher perspective here because I am very much based in the classroom with 16 to 18 year olds uh, who are mostly studying towards their A-levels. Uh, and I think I'm gonna almost reiterate what Tammy and Elaine have said, because I think it's really important that they have not only the ability to understand the science, but to also integrate that with their ideas and values about society. And often those get separated a little bit. And bioethics is a really exciting opportunity to bring those aspects together and to really emphasize the relevance of the topics that they're doing in the science and the fact that they're becoming the decision makers about what is acceptable going forward. 
forward in these great societal debates that are going on around genomics and at the same time to upskill them so it's not just the scientific content but also the way that they can think about it and present their ideas on bioethics which uh, requires skills in scientific arg scientific argumentation and an ability to integrate both the science and their thought processes together and I'm hearing a lot of those, what they call 21st century skills or future ready skills in what you're describing here, um, which helps not only prepare students for a workforce, regardless of discipline, but also um, you were talking about helping them make connections to their own lives, which um, has a lot to do with um, how we're engaging students in their own STEM identities. So it's really interesting to hear these through lines. And I'd, I'd like to kind of continue with you, Karen, um, this is not light stuff. This is not easy stuff. So when you think about teaching bioethics, what do you find that students struggle with the most? What's the hardest part to teach? And what is uh, kind of lighting them up? What are the things that engage them the most in your experience? Uh, so I'm lucky to work with a very able body of students. So it doesn't send, tend to be that they have so much difficulty with the concept as with the cognitive load, I think, of actually putting together some of the bioethical frameworks and the scientific content and the critical thinking skills and coming up with a framework in which they can actually express it. So I think it's not specific concepts I think all of those can be explained and can be covered and they seem to grasp them and enjoy grasping them and and uh, grappling with some of them I think it's more the cognitive load of bringing it all together so that you get something meaningful out of it mm -hmm. so that kind of synthesis the process of synthesizing information from all these different domains and bringing them to the table um how about for you Elaine um what do you find is the most challenging or um, gets students going the most, resonates with them the most. I mean, it's interesting because, uh, you know, say most of the, the times we're doing the bioethics piece, it's with uh, teachers. Um, but we have had occasion where we brought in this sort of 15 to 16 year, uh, year old age group um, and, and uh, had those conversations with them. And it was still, it was actually quite similar to, to their teachers, the, the ones that they sort of got very animated um, about. I think they, they struggled with issues, what I, I sort of called it, the ones on the thin red line, you know, those sort of issues around the determination of life or genetic manipulation, um, you know, inherent biases. This is when they're, they're sort of their, their, their passions come through. Um, and um, as Karen said, sometimes it is about try, for them trying to uh, synthesize all of that and pull all of that together, the, the, the reasoning, the, um, you know, the, I suppose the data and the, and the concepts and articulating that. Um, um, but I suppose then there's other things that they found a lot easier to grasp and a lot easier to make decisions on and those were typically issues around sort of you know using um, data profiling in, in criminality for example or you know disease prevention or treatment so those sort of issues they seem to think was more cut and dry but they still brought passion to whatever it, it, it was but there, there always seemed to be more discussion and maybe they grappled a little bit more with with those sorts of um, those sort of determination of life type of issues, I think. The hot button topics and the things that inspire passions and can be very scary for teachers to actually teach in the classroom, depending on the environment in which teachers are supported. And Tammy, how about for you? Has that been your experience, the similar challenges and similar excitement? I would agree 100% with everything that's been shared so far. Um, I was thinking about what Karen was speaking about and the importance of discourse mechanisms. How do we speak to one another and how do we communicate? Um, the students that we have in our district can, they bring what they have modeled for them. So it gives the opportunity to model healthy dialogue around things that aren't easy. But I also think it opens up the opportunity to explore people that come from lots of different walks of life. So it's a, an area to examine cult, being culturally responsive, right? Do we understand why student X believes this and because we all come to the table with something. I have found over the years, the identification of their values, what they believe in, as they try to figure out what their values are in relationship to maybe what their parents taught them, because they are becoming their independent selves, right? They're taking in a lot of information. And I find that bioethics provides a great springboard for their own reflection. So I think that helping them become 
reflective um, and taking on that cognitive responsibility is um, one of the things I really like about bioethics as a, as a course itself. Um, I think listening, um, I'm a strong believer we don't listen enough to other people and actually hear them and understand what they're saying and why they're saying it. Um, and I think that um, that's all part of what these types of lessons and classes are about is, yes, it's framed around the science and the connection between ethics, um, but there's a lot more to it that are those soft skills. And I don't like using soft skills, 21st century skills, all of those words, um, but those are the things that students need when they leave us. They need the content, but they're also gonna need um, the ability to, to do those things with other people. Um, I would agree with um, Eileen about the sort of difficult sort of, Elaine, I'm sorry, the difficult um, lessons that might happen. Um, and I think that that leads to having strong um, educator skills to manage conversations around things that can be challenging. Um, I think they do come passionate. They like to talk. Um, students often are in seats and rows and this provides them an opportunity and a voice to be able to have agency around things and actually feel like they matter. Because I think often as adolescents, it's, it's not an easy time, but they're being told a lot of things. You should do this, you should do that. Um, this provides them the opportunity to build their knowledge base and be able to share that. So I think that it is a lively class usually is how I would put it, um, an engaging one, no matter what the subject is, but some subjects are trickier than others. I love hearing you talk about this with this kind of civic dimension and that it's helping students not only build their STEM identities, but the, really their civic engagement identities as well. Um, that your opinion matters, your position on this matters, having the information to support why you feel the way you feel matters. Um, and as you say, this can be really challenging for teachers and especially for teachers who perhaps have been prepared as you know, in the science, but not necessarily in the facilitation of those kinds of conversations. So I'm gonna throw you in a sort of off script question and ask what, what would you recommend as good preparation for teachers? What strategies, Karen, have you used as a teacher to try to manage those conversations? Or are there any kind of tips that, or advice that you would give teachers to prepare for this kind of content? I guess there's different ways that you can do it. And it is one of the things that we look at on the teacher training program here in Cambridge, um, one of the ways you can do is to have a number of different, more structured strategies before you feel confident going in and just throwing the floor open. And so you have a little bit more control about what the inputs are, what the expected outputs are, how those outputs are gonna be delivered in the classroom. So actually going in prepared with a structure beforehand can be a good way to get started. Elaine or Tammy, would either of you add to that with the sort of ideas or strategies that you found to be particularly important? I, I agree with Karen and I would add having a critical friend, somebody that even if they're not teaching with you, that you can process some of the moments. Um, and sometimes there requires a revisiting and how even as an adult, you may have sort of managed a conversation. So I think having a critical friend, um, having trust and safe places to have your own adult conversations around what you're trying to do is important. Um, and I think that there are some resources out there that, cause there's not, I don't use a textbook when I teach my students, but I do think there's some solid resources that can help the high school level teacher, middle school level teacher with some of those skills around discussion to provide them as Karen mentioned structure, a way to, to get your foot in the door um, because I agree, not everybody can just go in and open the floor up. It can be, um, that can be problematic for some. But for you, Elaine, have you found any particularly important strategies or resources in this area? Um, I suppose one of the things that we, we came across was that this idea of the, this sort of jigsaw um, methodology, and you guys probably have heard of those, that sort of collaborative way of working where, where people feel empowered that they have, they they come to the table with a piece of expert expertise or a piece of knowledge um, so that everybody at the table has a, a piece of knowledge. So I think that was that was an important way for us to start framing the, those conversations that we were having, that we were empowering them, that they each had the, 
that you know something to contribute and then it was a case of you know back to that civic mindedness piece you know setting that framework with them that they are they are adults but i'm talking particularly about these the, you know our transition year students these 15 16 year olds that this is a you know a an, an adult conversation and we need to hear every voice um, and we need to respect um, other voices and to listen um, and, and sort of you know setting that those sort of um, rules if you like at the beginning of the the, the activity that we, we do and they really I found that they bought into that and respected that um, but like Tammy said having that uh, critical friend uh, that's some that backup piece um, is, is very helpful as well. And Karen you looked like you wanted to add something yeah, I was just going to say, especially uh, while we were online doing the teaching, we found that something called uh, mystery, uh, mystery student worked quite well. And it kind of builds on what Elaine was saying, which was you can emphasize the skills that you're looking for the students to have during a lesson, whether it's face to face or online. And say at the end, you're going to pick out, you've already picked two students and you're going to see if they've displayed those skills that you're looking for. And if they have, then there'll be a bonus for them, for the class. And you think of a they can go two minutes before the bell, they can have, you know, I don't know, something small in the way of a little bit knocked off their homework if they've done well and displayed their skills or something for them. Um, but just to get those skills that you are looking for explicitly stated at the beginning and all of them competing to try and display them. I love that, the joy of incentives. We always know that those work both for students and for adults, we know, let's be real about that. And I also wanna, um, I wanna thank uh, Salvatore Sierra put in our chat, um, he is one of our current ABE Master Teacher Fellows, uh, that bioethics provides an extraordinary opportunity to link scientific and humanistic thinking. So this idea about the kind of blurring of disciplines, as in real life, there isn't this kind of siloed experience of science, but in fact, it connects to so many other disciplines and so many other parts of our lives. And so it's a great opportunity to let students practice with the messiness of that and kind of opening that window. Um, are there any other resources before we move into hearing the um, activities you're going to share with us? Are there any other resources? I'm thinking about our teachers who maybe are interested in teaching bioethics, but may not feel entirely knowledgeable yet, or may not feel like they really know the content as well. Do you have any advice for them in terms of resources they should be looking at or how you might have actually built your own content knowledge that might be helpful? I'll uh, jump in and I suppose uh, coming from a, a communications background I've always kind of looked into the to the the media for what's current and topical and hoping that that's going to to help um, spark the conversation so um usually looking around to see see what's what's um, happening at that stage in terms of the the, the content that we're about to teach and then I, I'm not so fortunate like time to come from a background of, of having done bioethics but I, I found that publications like the Journal of Medical Ethics places like that and, and some really good online resources like yourgenome.org and and uh, I found DNA fingerprinting um, blogs and, and various um, pieces like that have been re really useful. I love that eye on the news approach that um, it, it can be helpful for, again, any content area. Karen or Tammy, any other good ones that you've, that you've used or that you rely on yourself? Sometimes if the government are doing a consultation on something, they produce quite a nice booklet, a consultation booklet, and you can not only use them, but you can actually get the students to respond to them because they don't get a lot of responses from that age range. Wonderful. So real world audience for their students perspectives, which is always great if they know somebody real is actually caring what they think. Tammy, anything you've run into or used? Um, I would agree with agree with Elaine. Um, I'm a big reader, so reading is not an issue for me. And I actually try to implement that in the courses I teach. So there are lots of books out there and the resources that will be shared. I provided a whole slew of books um, and potential resources or popular media. I think the popular, popular media is great. I always find it does take a lot of work to tease out and make sure you can move it forward in a way that helps direct the kids. Um, but it is one of my favorite methods. Um, and I would say, I think it's the NWABR at the Northwest. Um, I have it here somewhere. Uh, it's written down. I have it in my list too, but an NWABR has great bioethics primer. 
that's really great for people trying to enter bioethics from a high school level. It has activities, but it, and it focuses on anything from scientific questions or not just scientific questions. Understanding, and I'll talk more about this when I present, is we don't ask students to at, create questions a lot. We ask a lot of questions of them. Um, so being able to identify what types of questions are we asking um, when we're making some of these decisions. But I would say those primers were really helpful for me when I identified them because I, it gave me a structure that I could work off of. It didn't mean I had to go and use it all, but I went, oh, yeah, this is a great way for us to start building. I like to build a sort of a framework and build off of it, right? So not, I want them to understand their values. And then I want them to understand some questions and use real life engaging topics to do that. These primers helped. So I would say that was one of my um, go-tos regularly. I love what you said, Tammy, about sort of the importance of giving students the time and opportunity to practice structuring good questions. And I know that's come up in other roundtables, which is it's something students don't get to do a lot because they're kind of put in the position of giving back, giving back or responding all the time, as opposed to really crafting a question and figuring out those layers of questions. I know our ABE Italy team has done a lot of work in that regard in terms of developing levels of questions and what makes a good inquiry question. So I love hearing that come back again. Um, in the field of bioethics. And so I don't wanna eat into the presentation time because I really think this is why everybody comes to the table for this is they wanna hear what you're actually doing. Um, so this is the fun part. All of our panelists have done much more than talk about bioethics. They've actually done some activities with students and with other educators. And so we will have time after each of our panelists presents for some brief Q and A at the end. So please don't be shy, put your questions, your comments um, in the chat. We'll be sure to share those with our panelists and ask your questions at the end. So no matter how big or how small, please make sure you, you put them in there. And so I'd like to begin by inviting Elaine to share some examples of how she has engaged both students and teachers in this topic. And so Elaine, you should be able to share your screen and we'll give the floor to you. Great, thanks Jess. So. Now. Just need to swap my presenter view, I think. Oops, round way round. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, so I suppose I just wanted to, um, so in ABA Ireland, we've been in, in existence since uh, 2014. Um, so I just wanted to take a couple of examples from uh, that, that period of time when we've uh, been developing some bioethics. Um, so when we set up in, in, in Ireland, we tailored the ABE program to the Irish curriculum, obviously, and specifically to senior cycle uh, bi biology um, curriculum. But I suppose um, back in 2015, um, there was a report to the European Commission of an expert group on science education. And I just wanted to pull out one, one piece. There were six key objectives overall and, and some associated recommendations. Um, but they felt that really science education should be promoting responsible research and innovation and really trying to enhance uh, our, our, our public understanding of, of findings, but having our students being capable of discussing benefits and consequences. Um, so, you know, the, this, this happened in and around the same time that in Ireland we started looking at totally re reframing um, the junior cycle uh, curriculum. So this was, these are lower secondary schools, so from 13 to 15 years old. Um, so there was a re complete re revision and they obviously spoke to a lot, an awful lot of stakeholders um, and took on board the likes of um, reports such as this science education for responsible citizenship that was happening in the EU. Um, and you know, there was a lot of discussion about actually collaboration between formal and, and sort of non-formal education partners as well. So it was fantastic for us because it gave us the ability to actually really work with the providers in this in this space. So um, in, in Ireland, as I say, between the age of 13, 15 years old, this new junior cycle framework really focused on, as we were talking about earlier, the sort of 21st century skills. Um, and they, they really want to um, make sure that students coming through this program um, have those key skills. Um, and, you know, as part of that, then the uh, science specification linked to this new junior cycle happened in, in 2016. So that's kind of the context of where we, we came into, into 
to play with this. And we really started thinking about um, having extension activities for our laboratory practicals and sort of introducing bioethics um, alongside as a almost a companion activity, I suppose. Um, so we started with our DNA profiling um, laboratory. Um, and here we, we're talking about um, profiling and what it's used for. And we give an example, um, a hands-on example of where we have a crime scene and we get the, the students to actually uh, figure out who uh, was responsible for the theft in the jewellery shop. Um, so it's a really nice way to, to introduce um, a profiling, but in terms of bioethics, it was um, a really good and opportune time to introduce this because at the time um, in Ireland we were actually talking about introducing a national um, DNA database um, for use by our, um, our, by our police force. And um, so we really started with this in about 2016 and um, started looking at you know how we would actually um, incorporate this with, with our DNA profiling laboratory. And as I said, we, we used this jigsaw um, methodology and whereby we would give each of our, our students a piece of information about the advantage or the disadvantage of DNA fingerprinting, um, DNA profiling. And they came to the table with this, this um, expert piece of information, if you, if you like, and they were then able to discuss with everybody else at the, at the table um, from their perspective, whether or not we should actually introduce a, a national a DNA database into Ireland. So their, their task at the end of it was to, to create a poster um, and they had to select um, we, we gave them the, op uh, the opportunity that they could either be for or against setting up a DNA database. So it had to be a democratic decision um, after having a discussion um, on the, the, the pros and cons of DNA fingerprinting. Um, so the example that you, you see there is just one of the examples. This is actually from um, one of the, the, the groups. This was a teacher group um, and uh, they, they definitely brought the, the A into, into STEM um, when their, their actual poster piece. So it really, it was a nice way to, to bring that discussion to the table and then set them that, that, that task and they really had to work together um, to say, you know, what were the arguments for or against a uh, particular in, in, introduction. Um, we moved on then in about 2019 and we started working with a uh, support service for um, the teachers. The, this is part of the, the government's Department of Education and Skills and um, in order to enable and, and um, empower teachers to actually deliver this new junior cycle in the, in the classroom. Um, this grouping started uh, to look at various partners around the country and uh, delivering um, continuing professional development workshops um, to look at various areas within within STEAM. And I suppose what was what's really nice about working with the, the junior cycle for teachers is that you you get um, uh, not just a view of, of how this should be delivered, but you're bringing your own expertise in, into the mix as well. So it's a, it's a really nice uh, combination. We learned a lot about learning outcomes and learning intentions and what teachers needed to be equipped with within the, the classroom. So we started looking at um, the theme that was set was looking towards Ireland in 2050. And we were coming in under the humans strand of that. And I suppose it was, it's that idea that you know, with all the advances that we have in, in, in technology, we've come on in leaps and bounds, but we want to explore sort of the possibilities of what healthcare could actually look like and probe if, if people would actually be willing to live with all the knowledge, the full knowledge of what their future holds based on um, their genetic makeup. So again, we were taking this idea of DNA profiling um, and genetics and moving it on um, and having tried to have that discussion um, with, with that. Now, the teachers that we were working with weren't just science teachers. Um, the whole idea with the STEAM is that you, you introduce topics across the entire school. So we were working with teachers from home economics, from art, from English, and we were really taking a, um, a topic and I suppose, you know, bring a scientific approach to teaching that, that topic right across the, uh, the school. Um, so what we took was something that was quite topical at, at the time, I suppose uh, around Christmas or birthdays, people would be getting these, these little kits um, that they could test their health and, uh, and ancestry. Um, so we looked 
and sort of the practical aspect around, you know, the process of genetic testing. But alongside it, we had these discussions about the societal implications um, of genetic testing. So it was kind of a, a, a monopoly board that we set them on. Um, and at each stage, we, you know, from taking the sample right through to, you know, the sample being tested within the laboratory and people actually getting, um, you know, assessments at the end of it of their risk of prediction of disease. Um, we did the physical, the practical piece of it, but then we introduced that, that discussion. And that was really, really rich learning from, you know, people literally taking um, a swab um, of their cheek cells and popping that into an Eppendorf and handing it over, that physical piece of handing it over as if you were sending it off to, to a laboratory for, for testing. Um, and, and people said, oh my God, I've, I've, just, I've just given you my whole genetic makeup and you can do with it what you will. Um, so it was, it was, there were some really interesting conversations right through that sort of monopoly board, if you like, of genetic testing and the prediction of disease. And these are some of the quotes that, that came out of that discussion and that, and that conversation. Um, and, you know, the, the things like, could my information be used for other purposes by the company? You know, the, the psychological aspects, you know, do I spend my whole life worrying about um, developing a disease if my risk is X um, and I'm, I'm told I have this risk when I'm age 30, do I spend the rest of my life worrying about it? So it, it was it was quite, they were interesting conversations that were, were being, being had and, and um, certainly the, the teachers got um, not just the, the practical aspects of, of the, the testing piece, but also then the discussions going alongside it. So from the, teaching the, 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 the teachers, we then uh, had an opportunity to, to work with some 16, 15, 16 year olds on our transition year program. So this is between the junior and um, senior cycles. Um, and we looked at that um, in, last, in the last year. Um, and at this point, the National DNA Database um, has been set up um, by Forensic Science Ireland. That happened in 2018. Um, and it is, they collect samples from the crime scenes and um, store those and that's shared um, with other um, policing forces across, across Europe. So it's really that whole idea of going from the crime scene to the DNA database. Um, and the task that we set for, for the, the pupils in this instance, you know, after explaining to them about the DNA database system and what it comprised, um, and the, the success rate of actually matching crime stains to um, it, you actually um, getting convictions, um, we set them the task again of having a look at, um, you know, whether they thought that we should set up this national DNA database of DNA and genetic profiles for every citizen, not just people who have been convicted and have a criminal record. Um, so again, this idea that, you know, each of the, the, the groups had an X amount of time to read a certain amount of information. And then they, we had a, a discussion. Again, they had to, to design their, their visual poster and the conversations um, in the room were ranged from that whole, whole notion of, you know, the benefits of preventing crime right through to you know, the, um, the, that sort of determination of life. And yes, um, it, it, it has positives, but there are, also uh, huge negatives that, uh, that could potentially come about and what happens if, uh, if we take it to the next level, if there's no controls. Um, so I suppose the, the, the differences between our, 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 our two cohorts of, of teachers and, and pupils, um, you know, I, I think they both tackled those bioethic questions really, really well. Um, the, the teachers having that, that notion then of how they could conduct those conversations and get the best out of their pupils um, within the, the, the classroom setting. So let's say just two or three examples of how we've implemented um, bioethics within the program. Elaine, thank you so much. It's so fascinating to kind of hear all of those layers of preparation and then to see how it actually came to life in the classroom, sort of how you went into it, what the rationale was, um, the kinds of supports that teachers needed, and then how that translated into actual classroom activities. So thank you so much for sharing that. And we're going to get to hear another great example from Karen. Um, again, classroom teaching perspective. How have you actually worked this content with your students? And are you able to share your screen, screen Karen? Great, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, 
hopefully you can see that okay now. Yes, yep. we can. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. So I thought I would do more of a classroom teacher's perspective and things that I have sewn into and around the ABE curriculum as I've been using it with 16 to 18 year olds. So I've got three examples. I am going to whiz through them because eight minutes is a really short amount of time. Uh, the first one is not dissimilar to some of the bits that Elaine was talking about when she was touching on uh, sending off personal genome information for sequencing. So one thing I have done is look at direct to consumer genetic testing with students. This came up one year in particular when 23andMe plastered a huge poster right outside the college advertising the fact you could spit in a vial and send it off. And the way that we did it, because we're very time poor in our curriculum, because there's an awful lot in there, was to flip some of the learning. So we supplied some uh, articles for them to start with. One of them was particularly interesting. It was a journalist who had sent off the same DNA to three different companies to try and find out what her ancestry was and got completely different results from all three. From the articles that the students read from the flipped learning, they were then asked to talk through and to discuss what the issues could be about direct to consumer genetic testing. And they often come up with a lot of the things that are there in the literature and have thought about them quite deeply as well. So we use both in the classroom, you can have agree on one window, disagree on another window in terms of structure. As a line of agreement, you can stand anywhere along there and then you could ask them, would you send off? So you can get some kind of elicitation of what their thoughts are very rapidly. And if you're doing it online, that's where the 10 to one comes in because they can put a number, it can be any number between one and 10 into the box just to get an idea about what they're thinking. This was quite nice because uh, in California, of course, then there's been the test case that's been going on with the Golden State Killer. So there's a narrative that you can follow up on about how when you do it, it isn't just your personal information that is being shared because you share a lot of that genetic information with other people in your family. And there's been that whole case that you can bring in uh, that's still ongoing, I believe, at the moment. Um, a more in-depth one that I developed with another organisation uh, at the University of Cambridge was about genetic engineering, which uses the same techniques as the ABE programme, but it's looking at how you can use it with plants. So again, we started with lines of agreement and generally students are quite happy that you can engineer plants. Plants are OK to engineer, they're happy enough with that. Then what we do is we get them to have a look at the context. So this is trying to provide a structure for them to put some of their ideas into. From there, we look at different bioethical frameworks with them and we steer away from, but show them what some of the more in-depth ones are and push them towards something that's a little bit more within their capabilities. So looking at personal, social, economic and environmental implications. Then as Elaine, I think it was Elaine or was it Tammy was saying about the jigsaw approach. So that's still providing structure and how to write that structure with the claims, the evidence and the conclusion. So introducing the skills on scientific argumentation there. We have uh, developed eight different cards which are all personalised, they're all different people, they get given to a different member of the team, they can then read that viewpoint, and then as a group they have to discuss those eight viewpoints, and they have to arrange them on a piece of paper, so they're either for or against. Then we say, okay, but it's not just about the emotions and the thought, uh, what people's opinions are, it actually has to be backed up with fact. So there are then eight cards and they can match those cards to the people's opinions and they can put it in for and against and they can see if it changes the order of uh, the importance of the different issues as it comes up. And you can see down the side of those cards, we've got whether it is personal, economic, social um, or financial implications that are going to be important. So it's guiding them as to how they can then start to put that into a framework to pull it all together and then we have to write longer essays about evaluating so we put it into an essay format and explain how that bioethical framework and the scientific content can come together within a framework again you can go back to it with these ones the line of agreement doesn't tend to be that controversial because it's the plants 
more interestingly, when we have a little look at gene editing, which is really extending beyond the genetic manipulation and looking at a new technology that's been used in a similar way, did something called a diamond nine. So what you do is you have nine diamonds and on each of those diamonds, uh, you have a use of gene editing and they have to rank them basically within a diamond shape. So the one that they think is the most acceptable use goes at the top and the least acceptable use goes at the bottom. So I pulled out nine different uses of gene editing, and this was from a government document that was in consultation at the time. And they had to, uh, first of all, rank them. And then we did a more structured approach afterwards, but they had to look at things like gene editing in agriculture, yeah. gene editing to create chickens that produce only female offspring to improve the yield of eggs. Mm, heading into animals there, start to get a little bit more wary of that. Um, whether it actually needs to be labelled now that we are, or now that we have left the EU, as in England, we have more control over our labelling. Whether we should be able to control mosquito populations using gene editing and gene drives. Whether I know that there was a successful example of this back in January, February this year, the man survived, I think, for an additional five, six weeks beyond what he was expected to, having had a pig heart. Never a popular one. However, it's one of the uses of gene editing to produce bacteria intended to cause a disease outbreak. And then when you get into humans, there's a whole another dimension to the discussions that start to come up and that richness of debate about whether humans are just animals, whether we sit above animals, often comes out in the way that the students are thinking about it, whether it's acceptable for disease, whether it's acceptable actually for things like athletic ability as well. Um, what I did in class was we had to go at the Diamond Nine, then we had a more structured approach to looking through and debating through it. And afterwards, we then uh, wrote out a structured answer to it and submitted it to the Nuffield Council on Bioethics as part of their discussion about how genome editing should be used in the future. Students loved the day that we did. They found it very interesting, worthwhile, opened their mind to the ideas about genetics. And we found that a lot of the students who weren't necessarily engaged in pure subject content really engaged when it came to actually being able to express themselves and be a bit more creative and linking some of those ideas together. Um, we didn't get a letter back from the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, but when I did the one before that, when the Human Genetics Commission did one uh, looking at genome sequencing for newborns, we actually have a letter which is framed at the school saying, thank you very much. We don't often get responses from the 11 to 18 age range. And yes, actually, this is the technology and the legislation that's going to be going through and affecting them through their lives. Students love looking at it. The fact that they've actually contributed to that discussion. Um, I thought I'd just summarise, I've only got three resources, it doesn't sound like it's as extensive as Tammy's, but the article at the top is a really lovely one because it does compare the different uh, direct to consumer genetic testing. The second one down is the SAPS EIT food uh, project, which I did a couple of years ago, which is all about the genetic engineering resources. And then at the bottom, if there's, you want to have a look, there's that guide on genome editing. Karen, this is so wonderful. And I, I just am I'm getting excited just hearing about those authentic audiences and hearing that students are seeing themselves as actually communicating with decision makers and leaders and having a voice and a place in that environment. And I loved what you said about the fact that this is the science that will be shaping their lives. And so this age range, it matters that they're able to think about it in that way. Um, so I don't want to take any more time because we're already over. So, so sorry, Tammy, but it is your turn. Can you share your slides and I will shut up and give you the floor. I think I'm there. Everything's all set. Perfect. All right. That those are two hard acts to follow that I can tell you. Um, the diamond nine. I love that. I am. I'm going to walk away and start playing with that right away. Um, one of the things that I do post, and I just put this on my slide, is in the framework of our classrooms, we have critique ideas, not people. So really getting to the basis of the communication and preparing science citizens um, for healthy discourse. Um, I, 
I had the benefit of seeing the other two presentations first, and I used that to differentiate into something a little bit different, but it's similar to some of what Elaine did and Karen, so there's probably going to be a mesh. Um, this slide is really, I think, enveloping the things that I may not have been able to cap encapsulate in my introduction, but really getting those students to think critically and evaluate claims and evidence um, and prepare students. In the United States, we have provided a frame for, framework in the last 10 years with the next generation science standards that actually gives every teacher the power to explore these things when we sometimes think we can't do that, we have to do this and we have to do that. Um, I do think there's a framework that teachers can use um, and pull out um, components of it to help drive their lessons and support the lessons that they're generating. So I don't wanna read those, but I wanted to put them into the presentation for those that would receive them now and later, um, but it does reinforce the changes that are happening at a speed that's, you know, I think back to, I won't age myself, but um, biotech when I graduated in biotech is different than today. Um, and the things that we can do, whether you're looking at the Cas9 or CRISPR systems, et cetera, this, these kids are learning things that are off the charts. So it's exciting. Um, this slide I wanted to put up there because I needed to philosophically ground myself in why I think, what drives my interest in doing this. And one of the things I wanted to point out not mentioned earlier is that in the courses and in the classes, we do try to provide some student agency. And the topics that were presented so far are within all the realms that we use and what we teach, um, but what, providing students with the opportunity to say, I'm really interested in this. And I think during COVID and during the pandemic, we had our students doing that more than we ever used to. And I think that's an important change, which is saying, you know, how many students wanna look at DNA profiling or how many wanna look at gene editing? And, you know, I'll be honest, the GMOs don't tend to go very far, it seems. They're less, when the, the further we get away from humans, and I would agree is like, they're less interested, um, but there's some real meaningful things that we need to take care of. Um, if we look at food insecurity, I think there's some real things we, sh we should be bringing to them even if they don't always like it. Um, so I think the others um, fit into things I've discussed earlier. Some of my favorite lesson strategies, and they're not limited to all of them. So I love jigsaw, Elaine mentioned jigsaws. Um, I love that. Um, I do like case studies. Um, I do think it's a place for reflective writing that doesn't happen as often in science as it does in their humanities courses per se. Um, so I think that's something that I've really enjoyed. Our district has done professional development on Socratic seminars versus Socratic debates, um, which we have, we did across disciplines. So it was social studies, science, um, English. We all had the opportunity to collaborate, which was fantastic because we have since visited each other's classrooms, even if it's not our discipline, to look at the techniques and way to have Socratic seminars effectively sort of managed and planned, et cetera. Um, the use of media came up earlier, 100%. Um, there's so much out there. I love the four corners thing, which is an alternative to the continuum sort of idea um, with the disagree, agree, strongly disagree, and strongly agree. Um, always within the frame of switching it up. How do I word my statements? Um, and always having students reflect, wait a minute, I need to move now. Maybe this isn't where I belong. Maybe I need to, to save face and move to someplace else. So a couple of the examples that I'm giving are um, a little less um, detailed, I would say, compared to the other two. Um, this particular is, so I would say, the quest to keep up. One of the things I found was students are tired a lot. They are overextended. They, I think they have a hard time managing all that life throws at them. Um, so there was a movie that came out called Limitless. Um, and then there's the neurotropic drugs that people can look up and sort of see, but how can we enhance our brain functions? Um, Katie Cur Couric in the United States and probably 2010 CBS did a whole interview process with college students around the use of Adderall. So you're looking at off-label using of drugs. So I decided to just sort of create it with my own name, right? And sort of put out, these are all the things that Tammy has to do, right? And she has to try to keep up, how is she going to do this? She already loves coffee, which I never drank as a teenager. I think there's a lot of people in sort of my generation that coffee wasn't the thing where now kids show up to school with coffee to get through their day. 
Um, but how is she going to do all this? So then the ultimate question is a lot of should questions, right? So should her friend staff provide her with some medicine to help her study, to help her stay focused? Um, the students within the work around the idea of, it was an interesting breakdown to see where they would fall, where it's like, yeah, it's okay to do that. It's okay to borrow somebody else's medicine. So it, I use this as an intro activity, right? To then go back and dig deeper and go down into um, the components that we're talking about. Um, in an elective class, we might show a movie, right? We actually might engage with some of the media that is actually put out there and use it as a way to, I would say, evaluate it for scientific accuracy, et cetera. Um, but this was a favorite of the kids was when it was directly about them and sort of how they live and choices they may make or not make and if they're right or wrong. And um, I found this to be a pretty powerful lesson. So I wanted to sort of share that idea with you. It was something simple, um, even if you didn't have to do a lot of preparation. Um, a simple paragraph could get them talking about it. Um, so that was a big win. Um, the woolly mammoth, the idea of de-extinction. Um, again, looking at the gene editing and the other examples that had already come, I said, I'm going with de-extinction because um, having not felt well lately, for example, I have asked my family to give me a baby dinosaur after the, watching the prehistoric earth, David Attenborough, Apple TV program. And I thought, okay, I'm going back to Jurassic Park right now. I sure would like a little T-Rex, even though I know he's really not what I want. Um, but the students, um, the woolly mammoth examples continues to hit the news, continues to provide some information around environmental storage of carbon dioxide, et cetera. So it has a very, it's beyond just, should we bring animals back and is it responsible? It gets into a uh, deeper earth history component of what's happened, what was happening during their lifetimes. Um, and then it can actually be moved to present day. Um, so I did not have access at my school this week to dive into some of the resources to put them more formally up here. Um, but I definitely wanted to share that this is um, a topic that's, I think they really engage with. Um, I've done a Socratic seminar around it. Um, there's definitely some, um, the dawn of de-extinction, Are You Ready? by Stuart Brand. If you're not familiar with Stuart Brand, he was a 1960s uh, mover and shaker on ideas. So I like those people that push the envelope. So um, he has some interesting examples in his short TED talk, if you are interested. Um, I mentioned earlier, so there's the NWABR. I, that's actually a hyperlink that goes to the resource that I was mentioning around the ethics, um, bioethics primer. And similar to Karen, the idea of what types of things do I want them to focus on? And it was really looking at scientific, ethical, legal, um, but not forgetting that personal preferences, um, cultural upbringing, cultural meaning and religious aspects play a role in decisions and what's allowed and not allowed. So. They provide a baseline um, lesson I think is very easy to implement right off the bat. I think that's great, but I also then wanna take it the next step, which is have my students actually drive the questions. So I want them to practice first so that they can move into it collaboratively. So something I might do is actually take a, an article, this was a National Geographic a number of years ago, but the organization, Beatronics, Beat, B, I can't actually see it. Um, the organization, it's a Monsanto um, sidebar, but there's a quest for a super bee. As we know, our pollinators are in danger. Um, so providing the students with some information, I want them to then break it down into coming up with questions that fit those categories. Um, and there's an opportunity for group work, right? One of the things I do like about bioethics that I'm not sure is mentioned yet is those quiet kids, it was mentioned somewhere, but there are students that don't it's easier to sit back and as an introvert, believe it or not, I am an introvert. I would, I will be that person that sits back in a classroom often unless I'm pulled forward. I think that bioethics provides an opportunity to really pull those students into a light and give them a voice that they may not give. And I do agree that it doesn't have to be the strongest science students. I find some of my most engaging students are those that are willing to take a few more risks because it's not, it's not about right or wrong and that fully, right? It's, it's about those other components that are deeper. So I would use Annie, something like the 
Yeah. Oh, time. Sorry to Good. interrupt you. I just wanted to say thank you. And would you share some of those amazing resources we've been teasing the whole hour? Sure. So I provided a short list. Um, these are just some of my favorites. I have used The Diving Bell and the Butterfly as a, a class read. Uh, it's a short book. It's a true life book. It's also, a, it was a movie. It's a pretty sad story in some ways, but uh, it's about being locked in, right? They can't actually communicate well. So there's some real life issues um, that are connected to bioethics. First, do no harm. Hands down, one of my favorites. It gets at cultural issues. It takes place in Texas. It's about a hospital. Um, but I have my high school students read this um, and sort of pull it apart. It's about four different life stories that go back and forth. So it's a very interesting read. Um, and students actually engage pretty well with it. Some of the other books I provide may be just for you, but um, they're there. There are lots of movies and other visuals that could be used. Um, I really like Miss Evers' Boys on the Tuskegee Syphilis Trials um, in Macon County, Alabama, some real important things. I work in a mainly white populated school district. So it's a great place for me to start actually exploring some of the more difficult pieces that they may not see in their environment or even think about. Um, so I do that one. And then there's just some links to, I think, some of the more powerful resources. I can't thank you enough. And Tammy has been fighting her way back from illness. So being with us today was just uh, we're really appreciative. And I want to thank again, all three of our panelists for taking the time to be here today. I saw lots of appreciation in the chat. Um, and again, everyone will get a copy of this recording and a transcript and the slides that our presenters have shared with us. But there's so much here, so much richness, um, interdisciplinary connections, great strategies and approaches, lots of resources in the chat. So thank you all for making the time. Can't say enough uh, about our tremendous ABE community. And thank you so much, Karen, Elaine, and Tammy for being with us today. And thanks to all our participants for making the time. And so we will see you again with our new roundtable session starting in September of 2022. And so have a wonderful break for those of you who get one and for the rest of you, enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.